Can I introduce Mr. Rob Hardy, please? Uh, so uh, I'm just going to start with some general questions, um, and then we'll we'll throw it open to the floor. But um, first of all, what a fantastic film! Oh, beautiful, painterly, fantastic, light, um, and shot on film. Yes. And tell yes. us about that. What's it like? <laughs> What's it like shooting on film? And uh, anamorphic. Uh, yeah. Um, when I first um, went to visit Rafe at his uh, wonderful flat just quite close to Brick Lane. I shouldn't actually give you the address, but um, he, uh, the, one of the first conversations we had was about, you know, obviously which format we're gonna shoot on. And uh, he was very um, in favor of shooting on film. Um, and the, one of the co-producers was there, Kevin Van Thompson, who was also the line producer. And he said to me, um, so Rob, let's not postpone the inevitable um, let's think about shooting uh, digitally for this film. Um, and as I looked at him, Rafe was stood just, just behind him, and he was going, film, film, like this, over Kevin's shoulder. And I said to Kevin, I was like, look, I think you know, it's only really inevitable if we, if we say it is. Um, and also, you know, given, given the fact that we have so much choice at the moment, um, let's discuss what we think this story, how this story feels, and also what we feel, you know, it should be, how we can do it justice visually. Um, as far as I was concerned, it was a film piece. It was a no-brainer. Uh, and of course, it was a question of whether we could, you know, make the budget work and do all of those things. Um, as it was, um, with both Rafe and myself doing this sort of double pincer movement on Kevin, uh, he, he quickly gave up and uh, agreed that we should shoot it on film, um, uh, at which point then production was just on our side from, from the very start. So all credit to them, really. Um, and then the next question, of course, was whether we shoot, you know, two perf, three perf, anamorphic, uh, the old anamorphic spherical question. Um, so then we tested the lenses and we quickly decided that the anamorphic glass was the thing that was gonna give us the, the texture, I suppose, that we were looking for. Um, and the quality, the painterly quality as well that we we strove for from the very very beginning, and we wouldn't we didn't want to let go of that. So that was definitely the way forward. And then of course when we were testing the glass, it was all about which anamorphic lenses. You know, you sort of start to break it down. And um, I was very in favour at first of, of, of the Crystal Express because they're they're kind of very old. Um, gauzy, velvety glass, but but they're really, um, I should be very careful about what I say about these lenses because Hugh's here from Panavision. Um, but they're, um, they're quite um, fucked up, um, shall I say. <laughs> they're um, very, excuse my language, That's but they're a technical very- term Technical term amongst us cinematographers. They, um, they're crazy, each one has its own individual personality and uh, I like them and I, I think for Rafe, uh, it was all a bit much. Um, at that point, because he obviously had so many other things on his plate, dealing with, uh, you know, being also the actor in the film and dealing with um, Maria's um, ego. So it was, you know, he had to kind of like, he had a lot on his plate. And I think he felt that, you know, we choose an anamorphic lens that, that whilst it has that quality, that painted quality at the same time, um, it's got an evenness to it. So we, we decided to go with the G series, which are a fantastic set of lenses. Um, Anyway, that was quite a long answer. To it, really it was question. interesting because there, there were none of the anamorphic flares that we would associate with the, um, you know, with the G series and with the, the Panavision lenses in general. Was that a conscious effort on your part? It was, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I always associate things like those anamorphic flares with them. Um, for me, it was like those old sort of John Carpenter horror films from the 70s. That, to me, you know, I, not, I, mean, I love those films, but it, it's not necessarily appropriate for what, for what we were doing. We were looking for more sort of hazing, really, rather than what I would call hazing rather than flaring, which, which mustn't be confused with milkiness. Um, so there's always that fine balance you know, between those two things. Um, but yeah, we weren't going to go kind of J.J. Abrams on, on it. It was all very... It wasn't quite right for the period. Well, I, I noticed at the end that there's both uh, Fuji and Kodak 
are accredited as film stocks. Yeah. Now, I know historically you're a Fuji user. Um, so why the, the change on this film? Why, why that choice? Um, but partly, well, two reasons really. Partly because um, I wanted to try something different. Um, again, this is the reason why I chose to, to, to well, one of the reasons why I chose to shoot this film is because I've never shot a period piece before. So um, uh, I, I have a good relationship, or I had a good relationship with Fuji until, of course, they closed, but uh, sadly closed. And um, I also felt that we were looking for something slightly different to, um, in terms of the color, uh, the interiors and everything that, that, that we were shooting in, that, that they were offering up certain, you know, in the Victorian period, and Maria could say a lot more about this, but it, it's kind of quite psychedelic, actually. Um, so I think, you know, I wanted to choose a stock that could offer me the option, uh, certainly in post, to, to either enhance that or not. So uh, at the same time, I, I'm still very much in love with that Fuji stock. So I decided to use both um, Fuji for exteriors uh, because of its weight uh, and, and Kodak for all the interiors. Okay, it, there was a fantastic sense of the quality of light, particularly the nighttime interiors. Um, I mean, how, how did you get that feeling that we believe it is candlelight? And we believe that it is, you know, lantern light. What was the trick? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if there's a trick. And if, if there was a trick, I wouldn't tell you. Um, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's one of those things, isn't that, it's that kind of endless challenge, I think, for cinematographers, I feel, but I could be wrong or right, to, to recreate, certainly in period pieces. There's another reason why I was quite excited about doing it. It's like, recreate the essence of what you believe um, those rooms and spaces were like 150 years ago, um, how they lit them, what it smelt like, all of those things that you, you in your mind, you, you try and capture, and you're trying to capture it visually. So um, as far as sort of you know, working with candlelight, of course, you, you know, I didn't really look um, too much at re referencing other films for that sort of thing. Particularly, we avoided looking at um, period films, actually, in particular. Um, mainly because I haven't necessarily believed the way in which a lot of them have dealt with interiors. Um, because also there's such a great, you know, we have such a long history of um, period film language in this country. So. Um, there was always that idea to try and sort of break that mold. And by, you know, using um, a certain kind of light to a, a sort of more, I suppose, velvety, gauzy thing, and it comes back to that, those two words that I keep, I keep thinking about when I look at this film, is that I wanted it to feel like the light was coming from within the frame as opposed to from outside of the frame. Um, so... Uh, for example, when I looked at, you know, the, the only other films I did look at were um, Cabaret, uh, Bob Fosse's Cabaret and um, Lost Highway uh, were my two visual, <laughs> film visual references for this. <laughs> and I think actually, and also to a certain extent Blue Velvet as well, because th there's something about the way in which the light in those films seems to emanate from the camera itself, in a way, from from the perspective of the viewer, and there's a tr I found there was a truth in that. Um, so that you know, when we, with that in mind, when we entered these rooms, these sometimes tiny rooms and sometimes huge rooms, you know, we worked on this premise that um, we would always go with gaslight and or candlelight, um, whether it was motivated from a chandelier or or. or the footlights and on the stage and any of those things and um, we started with this with this concept and of course gaslight itself is actually quite a cold light um, and so I started by completely ignoring that fact uh, because I'm not fond of white light so much so everything was slightly warmed warmed up but I kept saying to Maria let's let's just have real gas let's have real candles and forget the lights um, we'll just shoot that way and health and safety of course we couldn't do that so we burn everything down plus um, we didn't really have the money did we to do that um, 
anyway, so yeah, it, 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 it's, it's sort of a number of things that, that, that brought us to that decision of, or rather the method of how to, to create that light. Um, I'm not really telling you about how I did it, am I? I'm just going round and round in circles. But, uh, Lots uh, of diffusion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, it, it was incredibly and beautifully dark, um, which we so rarely see in a period piece. It tends to be so romanticized. The things are overfilled. Do you um, have much um, problem from production when they were looking at the rushes and thinking, oh my God, it's dark? Um, not really, no. Um, mainly because actually, Rave, because of Rave, I mean, he was very in favor of that darkness. He wanted that darkness. And, and it was, again, something we always talked about at the very beginning. And he positively encouraged it. And, um, you know, production pretty much would go with what Rafe wanted, or as much as they could. Um, so if, you know, he, had, he was very, he's a very persuasive man, I think. So they felt... Um, I mean, I didn't really hear any anything about darkness until, of course, we got to the grade, when there were a couple of moments where, um, and this was actually coming from Rafe more than anyone else, that about eyes, and it's you know from an actor's point of view, um, it's very much in the eyes, and particularly with someone like Rafe. I mean, those piercing eyes, you know, you can't you can't not but want to see them. Um, so. That was the only problems we had really with darkness. But again, it comes back to the truth. And it's all that question of the truth of what we felt it was like in those, in those days. I mean, who knows what it was like, because we don't really know. But, but in my mind, it was, you know, the interiors were very dark anyway, and the, the, the walls and such like. And um, there was only really, you know, whatever lights they had, whatever candlelight they had, and the tiny windows that were constantly you know, curtained up and with nets and curtains and all sorts of things. So it was like it became positively dark in interiors. So, so I, I didn't want to fight that. I didn't want to pretend it wasn't anything other than that. Brilliant. Um, you, you've mentioned Rafe several times here. Now, I had to just talk about the process of working with a director who's actually acting in, a, in the film itself. I mean, what were the, 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 the difficulties and the joys of that? <laughs> well, there, I mean, there, essentially there were two Rafes. Um, there was Rafe the director and Rafe the actor. And um, Rafe the director uh, was very, um, was quite an experimental man, actually. He, he would reference things like Bellatar and, and filmmakers like that so that it was always for him about the art of the piece. And then there was Rafe the actor, and um, he was obviously, you know, wanting uh, to deliver the performance that he knew he could deliver as superbly as he did. Um, but he also was very, a very generous man towards the actors, the other actors as well. And so, you know, he would think, Rafe the actor would think less about, uh, not think less, but, but would, wouldn't sort of put so much emphasis on camera or... or, or or design or anything like that because he would be concentrating on those things. So for me, and again, partly one of the reasons why I chose to do this was A, it's a period piece, and B, working with an, with a, an actor such as Rafe, but also as a director too. I saw Coriolanus, I loved also what Barry did on it, and I thought it was a fantastic film. Um, and he wanted to do something completely different with this one. Um, what was interesting is that Rafe, for the first two weeks was behind the camera um, so that we would, you know, get get the machine working, as it were, um, before he jumped in front of the camera, it became Charles Dickens. During that period, his beard got slightly longer and longer. It's his real beard. It's not a fake beard. Um, and he progressively became more and more like Dickens, um, up until the point that I remember the first day that he was in front of the camera, um, and we were shooting the interior of um, where they go to see Catherine, Tom Hollander's wife, the other invisible woman, as it were. Um, and I remember uh, I was doing some, some lighting, I think something, and I turned and I looked uh, over to the camera and there was Charles Dickens sitting, looking through my camera. 
And I, I just had this kind of weird sensation, it's like this is very, very odd, very odd. And, and so you know, partly I couldn't quite keep a straight face uh, in dealing with him at that point, uh, but then quickly got very used to it. And so essentially in my mind, ultimately it wasn't Rafe directing the movie, it was Charles Dickens directing his own <laughs> version of events, uh, which may or may not be the truth, by the way. Um, yeah, so, so anyway, he, 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 ultimately, Rafe is a very, very, very generous man, and he's very collaborative, and he trusted those that he, you know, chose to work with, and myself, Maria, Michael, uh, the costume designer, everyone um, involved in the project. He was, he, you know, once he'd chosen you, once he picked you, he picked you because he felt that you could bring your own vision to the film, and um, he never, he never once... Um, tried to override that. He was always, as I say, a very, I can't keep saying it, a very generous man with his um, creativity. We did, you know, we'll talk about it in a minute, but we did, uh, there were a couple of times we had to sort of sway his vision a little bit to, to make sure uh, we kept it in, in line with ours. Um, well, but, you know. uh, maybe at that point we should invite Maria down. Maria Jerkovic, Maria. the designer of the film, um, to also talk about <laughs> this uh, Um, so, uh, Maria, uh, the relationship between you and Rob, and <laughs> you and Rafe. <laughs> Let's talk about it because we don't often get a chance to have a designer yeah, and a cinematographer nice. and together. Actually, that's quite um, the fact that Rob even asked me here. That indicates how I guess we got on, which um, is incredibly important. And I think that was one thing that it was a very happy film, wasn't it? It was yeah. a very happy collaboration. And that was with all of us, with <clears throat> also with Michael, the costume designer. And Rob and I and Rafe and the location manager spent hours and hours and hours in a car driving around. And if you don't get on, it's, it's sort of going to show. And I think it, that, that made it a much easier and happier production. Well, tell, tell them how we bonded in the back of that car. <laughs> no, <dear>. <laughs> hours <laughs> and hours in a car. And, and, and Rob and I used to show each other photographs of our cats. <laughs> Rafe looked absolutely appalled sitting in the front. He was wincing, going, oh my god, it was my creative heads of department. <laughs> the, the creative process, the process is a weird thing sometimes. Yes. Um, let's just talk about, um, you know, Rob, you mentioned it, the conventions mm -hmm. of, um, of, um, of a period drama um, and how you fought to to break those conventions. And, and Maria, how, you know, the locations, I've filmed in every yes, single one I of those know, locations. Um, but how do you make yeah. them different? I mean, what's that process? I don't think we set out to make them different. I think we set out to try to make a, a period that felt very real. I think that was, we weren't, Rafe used this term, I don't want you to sex anything up. And I think there was this, this sense that you wanted to feel the mess, the grubbiness, the, the real life. And also because there's so many different uh, sort of social strata that you're moving through, whether it's, you know, the home of one of the most celebrated men in London of the time to these actresses who are on the very edges of, of, of actually respectability as actresses in their little cottage. And then they move up the next level when Dickens supplies them with their home. So that was, for me, very interesting to, to actually get a sense of of, it's a sort of not that the, the um, historical research is part of our DNA as, as designers, I think it should be, but it's much more about one, creating an aesthetic whole, which we were trying to do together, and um, I think trying to be very true to every level of, of, of as I said. So what, what, what sort of references were you working with Gosh, between the two of you? and anything, mostly yeah. paintings. All sorts of things. I have the uh, art department walls literally wallpapered from floor to ceiling in colours and images, and, and you know we spent a lot of time looking at those between the three of us. Right. And any conflict between the camera and the design? Do you think? Not really. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think there was. I think it was pretty yeah. harmonious. We tried wasn't to it, help. Rob? Yeah, we, we we would often try and help each other out. Um, uh, there's the the scene where with. Um, I mean, wallpaper, the, the, the almost, in my mind, psychedelic wallpaper that uh, played a prevalent part in, in many scenes um, was, became an issue in one scene, um, the baby scene in France. 
and it's this wonderful location where the, the ceiling has a sort of curve to it and Maria wallpapered it and it looked incredible but it was it was almost I remember Rafe walking Rafe was into, scared of it yeah he it's walked in and he, he was afraid he was very very afraid um, of it <laughs> so <laughs> we off, you know obviously were shooting the scene and various parts of it never really looking at the ceiling and then in the end um, I've got to be careful what I say here because he might watch this but in the end we were trying to figure out a way that we could basically Maria said to me you have to shoot the ceiling you have to shoot the ceiling <laughs> so uh, and then you walked in didn't you, you I felt, walked in and found Rob with the camera like this <laughs> I kind of thought blimey thanks and Rob. I basically said to Rafe look um, you know the, well, he signs the death certificate for the for the for the baby I said um, what I'd like to do uh, uh, as you you know we'll, sh we'll shoot it in one and as you approach you know, slowly and surely, you know, the slower you approach it, the bigger you become in frame and, and until eventually you lean down and you sign the document, you'll be, you know, if I place the camera maybe down here, <laughs> uh, then, then we're really going to see the emotion in what's going on in, in Dickens' face. And he's like, oh, yeah, 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 I like that. So uh, we shot it, and of course they didn't, they didn't use the piece in the shot where he leans in, so actually what you get is exactly what we intended was this. But I actually think it, I mean, it, there was a re it wasn't just because we liked the wallpaper, it's because at that point in time in the story, you know, it's like there's this sort of, I think now in retrospect you see it as this kind of like, this weight upon his shoulders, this kind of strange, uh, I don't know, this kind of, thing behind him that, that you, you feel, you feel his tension, you feel his problem, as it were, you know. But, but um, I think one of the things is that we weren't actually putting in ev any kind of gimmicks, no. for gimmicks sake, ever. I think we were trying to step away from that. Yeah, and it was the truth as yeah. well, wasn't it? It was really about, um, it was, as, as Maria says, we weren't, we weren't trying to do anything that wasn't. I think it's because of those, those conventions of, of period films is that everything always there's a, a tendency to be quite conservative with it I think that mm. idea that there are these constraints you know the Victorian era they were all very everything everyone was very but you look I mean you only have to look at what they wore and the way in which the rooms were I mean it was it I was, actually took uh, Rafe to the V&A and walked him around that period section and he was quite sort of <coughs> taken aback by the explosion of ornament and color and yeah <coughs> and, and so and was think, was he very active then um, within the design as well. He took I mean, a huge interest, and um, he actually went to art school, and he draws very well. He draws all his own storyboards. It's quite incredible. Yeah. Um, so he, he, he really took, he, he's very hands-on in terms of, he, he wasn't dictatorial in any way, um, and, and Rob no. has already said this, but he certainly was incredibly involved. He knew what was coming. He wasn't just turning up on set. And he was absolutely prepared. I mean, really, really, well really, really prepared. Right. Which was okay. great for us because then, you know, we didn't really waste time uh, trying things that we, yeah. you know, trying things out that we didn't feel were relevant in a way. So that we, it got to the point where we could just really concentrate on, you know, working on the things that we really had talked about and prepared mm -hmm. and then finding variations on those things. So. But actually in terms of never before have either of us, I'm sure, done a recce where you walk into a space and immediately your director starts to act the scene out. Mm. So you're actually seeing that scene played out in front of you. Mm. And you'd see, you know, six locations and you pick one, but you've seen that scene played out in all six. I mean, that, that's... Yeah, yeah. That's and I would photograph those scenes and of course Maria would have to play Nelly often uh, so I do have some photographs uh, in my camera at home with some embraces shall we say Whoa. with Maria and Rafe very interesting yeah, so, it's <laughs> so an actual bonus then yes. having the lead actor yeah. as the director it, yeah okay. absolutely yeah, yeah right. it certainly brings it to life I mean it's actually very different when you are walking into a location you know, that's how it's going to play. Mm. And then for me, that immediately informs me how I'm going to arrange that room from the start. And then obviously yeah. for you, how you're going to shoot it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. Rob did take these very, very lovely stills. So we've sort of got the film documented. That's right. And Rafe put them on his wall. So each scene he would always, in, whenever, you know, during prep, a new cast member joined us, he'd bring them into the room and he would talk them through this this effectively what he had was mm. storyboarded the movie. And I remember at the read-through as well, he. He brought his wall with him, 
and paste it along the back wall of the read through and then of course guided everyone through it and it was it was good because everyone knew exactly you know they knew the film we were going to make or intended mm. to make so oh fantastic which is great and so uh, were there any specific elements that that you brought in because rob had said something fascinating a couple of minutes ago as we were chatting about wanting the film to be um timeless as opposed to contemporary yes um so mm. how, how does one go about that Gosh, I suppose in terms of from, from my side of things, it's about not having everything exactly from that, exactly that date. So you're picking furniture, whatever, um, ornaments from a few years earlier. So it's never just pure. And also you're trying to create, oh, I, I don't know, it's the way you approach each different set completely from a different, you know, you're, you're, you're starting not from the point of saying it is 1857 and everyone had this, you're saying this, this interior um, has to be lush and exuberant and wealthy and something, and even with the spaces that we shot in, for example, the Turnham's Cottage, Rafe wanted, a, wanted somewhere so small that the camera couldn't move and that it had to mm. feel mm. small and restricted. Mm. So I think the thing is, 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 is to always go to the character, and that was very important to him, to start with the character, and then, and then let the period just fall away, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. you know, so you're going around the prop houses, and you're thinking about character, not about the exact date, mm -hmm. I guess. And it was exactly the same way in which, in which we shot it as well, you know, in which, for reasons of choices of where you place the camera. Um, and I, I was very conscious that I, I didn't want to do something that felt uh, when I say contemporary, I don't, I don't mean to, obviously from now, but what, I, what I mean is something that could, you know, look for, you know, have a particular look about it now, but maybe in two or three years' time feels strangely sort of like, that's how they shot period films in 2012, and now this is, it's, mm -hmm. it's more this question of just creating something you, you, can, you could watch now and feel the same about in 10, 15 years' time. It's always the films that I love are the films that I just feel never... They, they, they exist in their own world, you know, they have their own corner of the room, as it were, you know, their own piece of furniture which they sit on and that's it, and that's, that's where they stay, and they always belong there. Uh, and that's the way I like to see it, or right. try to see it. Well, you made some very interesting um, choices compositionally um, throughout the film, in terms of short sighting, um, also a lot of the, the, the dialogue scenes shot from above the eye line. Mm. Uh, what was the, the idea behind those? Um, I think initially the idea is that I always feel, or I certainly felt with this, that, that these conversations that both Dickens and Nellie had were conversations that deserve to be sort of partly, uh, it, it's almost as if you're kind of, you're not supposed to be there listening to it. I, I guess, in a way. So what I wanted to do was just by positioning the camera in a certain way was to create this idea that uh, you are overhearing something. You're, you're in the room with them, overhearing this conversation, uh, but not in a voyeuristic way, um, as opposed to using sort of conventional film grammar, which places the camera in a position where, in my mind, the person speaking will see the camera. So if that makes sense, uh, so they might not say what they're supposed to say because they feel like a film audience is watching. It sounds crazy as I'm saying it, but this is, the, this is how I sort of felt it should be. So I would often say to Rafe, you know, let's try this, let's do this, do this. And at first he was slightly resistant towards it. Uh, but then he got used to the idea and he, he got it, you know, he got this sense that, yes, we are overhearing this conversation. Uh, and I think it works well in some scenes. And then... There was the scene where they're counting the money, and um, he did say to me, um, I'd like the camera to be, I, I want to do a Hardy-esque frame, I want to be up here, you know, looking down, and, and I actually thought it shouldn't be that way <laughs> for that scene, and I said to him, I don't think we should do that, um, uh, at which point he said, no, I think, let's try it and see what, you know, because I th actually felt we should be more conventional there, but... Um, he was right. So we did. We ended up doing both, and it, it layers the, that conversation. But um, yeah, essentially, it's about proximity and you know that kind of feel. I feel like you're in the room at that point, rather, rather than watching a film. Right. And the the following from behind, the compositions from behind, 
um, you know, what was the, the, the concept behind those as well? Uh, uh, I'm just, I just like the backs of heads. I'm just obsessed with the backs of heads. I really want to do a film where it's just the backs of heads, which, <laughs> uh, which I'd love you to, do, to design. Uh, well, at least we'd see everything else. <laughs> so, you know, just, uh, Back of heads and beautiful. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd like to open up um, to the audience if there are any questions um, for both Maria and for Rob. Have um, you worked together before? No. I hope we work together again. Mm. But, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very clear that you actually almost immediately just kind of enjoyed the process. Yes, we did. Yeah. And the, the, the collaboration on the screen is just amazing. It's quite extraordinary. Well, Rape can also be very, very serious, and I think we had a shared levity over the whole thing. It was the cats. <laughs> Definitely the cats. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yep, yeah, right in the back there. Yeah, there are a lot of compositions through doorways and stuff. What was the thing behind them? Um, well, I mean, partly, partly again, that sort of sense that you are um, witnessing something as it unfolds. Um, again, sort of verging on slightly voyeuristic but not and partly practically because we just literally needed to sit back to do a wide shot um, and you couldn't be inside a room because it was so small so um, those compositions mm. through the doors tended to be in a smaller space right the one in mm. Spitalfields yeah. um, so that was you know the reason behind that uh, any other questions you at all. No, it was entirely on. Yeah, the only build was the train crash, which was obviously on the hillside. Oh, we did shoot the interior train at Twickenham. Yeah, blue screen and, and yeah. pick-up shots. That was yeah, the only but it was two days at the end where we, we were doing that green screen stuff and doing basically picking up close-ups of various bits and pieces that we hadn't shot throughout the film. So we had like three cameras on the go all at once over two days. It became like a workshop. Books and letters. <laughs> yeah, books, books and letters, letters, pages turning, glances, you know, all that stuff. Um, yeah. Are you good? Yes. Uh, did you have any, what is your edit process like in the Did you have much to say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they actually they were cutting the films whilst we were grading it when we got to the grade. There was still Nick and mm -hmm. Rafe were still fiddling with it um, uh, up to the point. In fact, that I when I saw it at the London Film Festival, I, I, was, I don't recognise some of these shots. They'd made some editorial decisions mm. after right. we'd finished the grade, <laughs> put shots back in, and so um, they're always open to. I always think it's good to develop a relationship with the editor anyway. Um, for the very, very, very beginning, when you're shooting, I think it's important to have that dialogue, have that conversation, so that you're all you're all on the same page. Which means, hopefully, the the film will have a visual flow to it uh, in terms of the way the camera moves and all of that. Because otherwise, if the film is cut against the way it's shot, it, it can tend to be quite jarring. Which which sometimes works if that's the intention, but. I mean, I don't know if, if you have that same thing with editors, but I always try and... I, it, it's always good to, to, to know the editor, um, but never expect them to listen to what you say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. They kind of nod and they go, yeah, that's a great idea. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but quite often they're right as well, so I've learned through bitter experience not to, to get too involved, yeah. um, because that's all they do. They edit. I don't do that. I'm a cinematographer, so you kind of mm. have to trust that they, mm. they, they'll do what they do mm. and for the best. Yep, uh, uh, yep one more question. Uh, Rob, how did you view your, your rushes? Because if you shoot the anamorphic, often the best way to see anamorphic is projecting, because mm. to see everything is quite hard to see on, on video or, or you know, DVD. Yeah, we only, unfortunately, because of the schedule, the places in which we were shooting, we couldn't really go to one place at the end of every day to look at you know one particular place, the same place, to look at rushes. And occasionally, we projected at Theatre 7 in Pinewood, uh, but only occasionally. Um, it was really at the beginning of the process. And then eventually, I was just watching DVD rushes uh, at the end of every night, just really you know looking at certain things that I particularly wanted to see or sometimes I like to watch them just on, you know, slightly on high speed so that I can look at 
again, the sort of overall, the broader picture of whether the shots are going to fit together and if everything has a sort of consistency to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was restricted to DVDs and, and, and laptops, really. Um, there's actually loads of very important uh, in terms of characters to the story too. And I just thought it's really good about the film shot there. Was was there any difference in terms of did you shoot a lot more for different stories or perspectives or of view than finding that bit for that? I mean, it, Not much, no, I don't think. It, it didn't. It felt like actually pretty much everything was shot it was. was there. Um, I, I'm just trying to think if there was a scene that. I don't think so. I, I'm always very aware because you, you do these entire sets yeah. and you go, bloody hell, we never see, saw that. I think we saw everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so in that respect, and again, I think that's probably all credit to Rafe's preparation, really, mm -hmm. is that, you know, he knew when something needed to not be in and something should be in. So, uh, and Abby, the scriptwriter, was very, very good at that. I mean, she's her script, script was, screenplay was very lean in that sense that, you know, she's experienced enough, obviously, to know the scenes that are going to work and not. I mean, there were one or two scenes that we, when we were shooting, and there were, this is always, I think, always fine, this is the case in every screenplay, that you know, you sense, okay, here's a scene that's, that's here and we're going to shoot it, but it will never make the film. And it all, it, you realize that when the actors start to struggle to block that scene. And we had two of those occasions when that happened. Um, and one of them, and I still watch it now, and I, I'm still not convinced actually by it, is the scene where uh, it's, it's post-birthday post party, Nellie's birthday party, and um, Mrs. Dickens has it's come in, in that extraordinary scene between uh, Joe and, <coughs> and uh, Felicity, and then afterwards, Dickens turns up with um, Wilkie, and um, it, it sort of seems a bit, I don't know why, it serves a function, that scene, but they struggled with it. Um, they struggled in trying to block it, they couldn't quite get their heads, I mean, even Rafe was like, we don't quite, we shot it anyway, and of course it's there because it serves a function to move things along. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was pretty much everything else was, Thanks, sir. Did he storyboard every scene? Pretty much. He did uh, his own storyboards. Yeah, he, he <coughs> in, in terms of, there were sort of representations of, uh, he would, um, not necessarily sort of storyboarding shots, but it was more a sort of, a, a sense of what a scene should feel mm -hmm. like. Um, I, I, I mean, I think you probably saw more of them than I did. I rarely laid eyes on them. I, I looked at his, lots of his line drawings, uh, which were more sort of like doors. Is Gustav Dore, isn't it? Who's that? Dore. Dore, sorry. I call him Dore, all right, darling? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dore. Um, Gustav, I call him. Yes, Gustav. Um, and Rafe was, was very obsessed with that. I mean, for example, the race, the race course scene where the shot which starts in the flags and just pulls out and the horses come through. That was based on a, a Doré um, illustration that Rafe um, was, was obsessed with and he would do his own versions of it. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to just go and sit back? <laughs> what, who was it? Doré was the, 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 the alleyway and the poor kids. And the but who was the race girl? This is really famous. <laughs> Anyway, let's I'll just call the diversion here. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was um, basically, yes, he did storyboards. <laughs> <laughs> um, Adam, you had a question? I <laughs> uh, just wanted to ask you about the DI process and how you like to work at that stage, how much you like to do. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's become such a big part of our jobs now. It's, you know, um, it really, for me, it's, you know, you, you finish the shoot, but you don't, you haven't finished the film. Um, and it sounds obvious, but I, you know, you, as a cinematographer, I, maybe you feel the same, but I think it's like you do, you're, you shoot with this in mind. It's not to say that we'll change everything in post, because, you know, I always approach a, a, a DI as if I'm not going to reinvent the film, but I'm simply going to polish it. Um, but that involves a lot of fine tuning, I mean, real sort of subtle, 
moves left and right. And it's really important you get the right person to to do that for you. Um, and I was lucky enough to work with um, Asa Shaw at Molinaire, who I think is a genius at this sort of thing. I mean, he's an artist in his own right, but he's sort of um, understood very quickly what we were doing. And also, to get Acer involved in the process very early on, so at the very beginning, before we started shooting, to look at some of the tests that we'd shot, to project those tests at Molinaire, and they've got a fantastic facility there in their um, big suite, uh, where they can project print as well as um, you know, 4K projection, 2K projection. Um, so it was also good to kind of sort of, I would constantly send stills to him during, during production, just say, look, this is the way in which we're heading, this is the way in which we're, which, you know, we want to do, and, and he understood it very quickly. And he's just, I think that's why it's like, it was good to work with somebody who's got a good instinct. Um, and then Rafe, of course, has got a fantastic eye when it comes to color and um, would come in and, I always try not to have him in the room all the, all the time, because I think it's important somebody's in the room all the time, and whilst, Potentially, the director can come in and out, um, which means that you know they can come in, look at the work you've been doing, and then suddenly say, "Ah, actually, that's working, and that's not." Or, um, so it's always good to have a sort of second view on it. And then, occasionally, you came in, didn't you, and just complained about stuff and <laughs> left. <laughs> when you were when you, when you were making the choice for film, the fact that you wouldn't have weeks uh, airlines, the, the fact the digital we um uh, y yes it did it absolutely it did definitely and um i mean we with with one of our actresses um julian white who's here now our gaffer invented a light um that we had that, that he made up in various sizes that we called the KST, and that we would bring on to set occasionally, well, all the time, yeah, um, to, to, yes, enhance certain, certain natural beauty that was already in place, as it were. <laughs> uh, but yes, film helped that, with that very much. But again, I mean... Um, yeah, she was. I mean, she. But they're, but they're all. I mean, they're such a fantastic team anyway. That I mean, it didn't really. To be in all honesty, it didn't really need much enhancing or, or much, you know, um, disguising because she was always. Jenny was always on it. She was always there. Um, but I, th I actually having a look at it now, and I think again, I was just saying to Sean just before. Every time I see it, I kind of like it more and more. Actually, it feels like it. It, it grows on you, as a, as a certainly visually, but certainly as a film in its way in which it tells a story. But I think it, just looking at it as something that's been shot on film, I really notice it in a good way. Um, yeah. Yes. Can you talk more about the movement and the stillness. How you decided at each moment when? Um, again, I, I, th I think that's the flow. That's how the flow works. So it's like with each scene, it's always... I mean, there are certain moments where you look at the, the film as a whole, as scripted, and there are always certain points where you're like, this is going to happen, absolutely. We know that, that at the race course, we want to do this shot, and that, that represents that moment. So then you build out from, from those moments. And I think there were one or two things, like, for example, where Nelly... Uh, first meets Dickens, this idea that we wanted this sort of visually swirling, the camera never stops moving, you know, and it was actually only, we, we tried to do it in two takes, so one that pulled her into the room and one that pushed her into the room, and then once we enter this huge room and there's Dickens and he appears from behind this scenery that's moving, you know, the whole, the whole thing is constantly turning and turning. Editorially, I think they slightly changed that, but, um, you still get a sense that you know we knew at that time this is this is how we want to place um, this particular moment. This is how we want it to feel. Um, and then I think other moments are pretty self-evident when you look at them, and they're blocked. 
um, to me anyway, it's, it feels instinctively, okay, this has to be, there, there could be no other way, you know, to do this. And, um, and hope, you always hope that, you know, um, that, you know, in this case, Rafe would, would agree. Um, and testament to his, you know, his great instinct is that we, you know, we often felt that, we often agreed on things in terms of like, yes, this feels like it should be still, or these, for example, the handheld moments, again, there were only, it feels like there are only a handful of them, strangely, but maybe there is, I don't know. Um, but to me, it was obvious. It was like, there's, there's no question that we're gonna be, we need to be right up there with Nelly, you know, really feeling the breath. And um, my favorite scene actually is the one which is, which is actually two things in one. It's like a very, very long static shot uh, where she's one side of the frame and he's the other. And um, and then there's this shared moment between this like almost kiss, as it were, but not quite. And to me, that's much more sensual than just doing a sort of, you know, love scene, as it were. And I think there was a real tension in that. Um, and it was just, I just wanted to glide around them as it was happening and just make sure, especially the fact that it's happening in the dark corner of the room, which again was was fantastic because it added to the whole sort of hidden moment of it, the surreptitious, that's the wrong word, but anyway, that sort of sense. So, you know, um, I think that was a good example of one of those moments where we just knew there were only two things we were gonna do in that room. That was one of them. Show the, show the set. <laughs> then do the drama. <laughs> uh, there, there was um, some wonderful tableaus, um, and one of the most striking ones to me was when, when she reappears back into Dickens' office, and there's that fantastic um, composition of her standing with the mirrors either side and the table in front of her. Was, was that specifically designed or found? Rob found it, and those are those moments when I'm watching rushes going, yes, that's, and, and you know, similarly in, in the cottage where there is that very lovely frame of the girls inside the room by the fireplace through the doorway. Okay. Those are the moments that I am delighted by when I'm watching rushes, but don't know about, because um, I'm not there while you guys are shooting, mm. so it's always a lovely surprise when you see those beautiful compositional moments. But do, do you design? trying to imagine them I mean, do you do you i uh, i don't i no that no. would be dishonest to say yeah. that that was specifically well, you but you do a, you, i mean you you design a room which is you, you essentially design a room which is 360 yes. degrees and he responds to yeah that which i think that's, is that's yeah. when the collaboration works i think yeah because Wait. often it's not that way. I mean, it's I not. Oh my God! No, it was it, that. That that's when it works. When when I do my bit ahead of everybody, and then you know, you know shooting crew arrives, and then yeah. and then I don't actually see it until I'm looking at. The yeah, pictures. and all I'm doing is just going, oh God, we've got to shoot it like that because the, what Maria's done, you know, it's that's the sort of, and then mm. you find a place for it in. Uh, well, it's not always, of course, it's not like that, but it, it, I mean, you know, it just so happened that um, when she enters the room and she has to make this announcement, you know, it's over. Yeah. She's made her decision, but in some ways you could see the sort of, or sense that slight faltering in, in her decision making, I suppose, but she comes in with great strength and, you know, it, it had to be a composition that showed that. It had to be something that sort of announced her entrance into the room uh, that would catch his attention. Also, that where he would look, he would look towards it and see see this, you know, um, woman um, who who he was in love with. And I think um, then, of course, he breaks it with his book business, like Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> Completely, yeah. yeah. Anyway. I yes, Nigel. Uh, as, as a young cinematographer, just finishing your first successful, I may say, period piece, what, what have you taken away from it? What lessons have you learned? And what, if anything, would you have shot differently? Well, that's a good question. Um, thank you for calling me young. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Uh, wow. I mean, I, I, I think every, every film is, as I'm, as I'm sure you know, you take, you take valuable lessons away from it. Um, uh, is to you know is to never stop learning, never stop because you can't stop learning. Um, I, there are things I would do differently, but I don't necessarily think that would change the way I feel about it now. You know, even if I did something, if I if I look at a scene now and I say I should have shot that in a different way, um, then. I would still look at that scene in the new way that I shot it and feel the same. So I think it's what I'm saying is, is that you just, you know, you walk away from these things, having felt you've learned something, specifically what that is varies. I know, I know this sounds really vague, but um, I feel ultimately humbled by it and grateful that, you know, it, it exists in the way it exists. Uh, and, and hopeful that it could continue to be seen, really. I mean, that's ultimately what you want, is that people to see, what, see the work and respond to it. I remember, actually, at the, we screened it at the London Film Festival, premiered there, and it felt like, for me anyway, it was the first time I'd seen the film, because you've seen the film so many times in the DI and various test screenings and whatnot, and then it's in front of an audience, but it's different. It's absolutely different. It, you feel, you can feel the temperature of the audience and how it's working, and and that to me is when the film comes alive. That's when it's it's, you know, it's birth happens, I suppose, in some ways. And then that's when you start to learn what's right, what's wrong, or what you think is right and wrong. Um, ultimately, I can't be specific about those things. But is there anything you feel like you look at it and go? I wish I'd done something else. No, no, no like you, it's just kind of. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, any other questions? Um, if not, then I would like to thank Maria and thank Rob you. for such a wonderful <laughs> film. Thank you all very much, and thank you all for staying. <laughs>